services are often in the business of finding accommodation for people with disabilities, um, but that is not the same as making home. And there's a really big difference, and there's some distortions that come out of that. Um, when, when the business of making home is turned over to services, and often they get um, things really uh, mixed up in their minds because they're trying to make a home for so many people at a time. And I think the benefit of families and the benefit of what we get to do is to think about home for one person at a time, one family at a time. And as Deb already pointed out, that's so unique and different from uh, every single person. So with uh, services and, and uh, large groups of people thinking of making home for other large groups of people, there's some real distortions that bring us away from the kinds of thinking we talked about earlier. Uh, so the limit to vacancy, it's really typical uh, for um, services uh, to kind of build homes or find homes and then um, find the people to fit into them. And so, you know, you're really starting from the other point of view. You're talking people into these roommates or you're talking people into um, a suburban kind of area when they would prefer to live in the inner city. Um, and so that really makes a difference in terms of your comfort and safety and your feeling of the dream of home that you might have had in your head has to be severely compromised in order to fit into the uh, housing that's available um, uh, from a given service. And so secondly, it is that option to fit into. And even that happens in some uh, uh, pretty odd kinds of ways. I um, had a tour of a, a new apartment complex that um, was going up in a, in a city. Um, this was in Australia, actually, a few years ago, but the same thing could happen in Canada. And it was, nobody had moved in yet, and it was a pretty lovely mixed apartment building. And in the building, among 30 or 40 apartments, there were about eight that were designed for people with disability. And we went into these eight apartments, and every single one had every kind of accessibility device that you could think of. They had these flashing lights for people who couldn't hear um, and would use that in case of fire. Uh, they had um, braille everywhere. They had physical access into showers and everything. And they were so proud of these units. And I said, well, you don't even know who the people are and which of those features that they might find helpful or useful. Um, it, they just had a generic disabled person in mind and made every uh, kind of accommodation possible. So such an example of you know, fitting into taking a generic disabled person, which I've never met a creature like that, um, and fitting them into the housing. Um, and certainly, uh, there's, uh, you know, services end up um, because they're thinking of many people at once, they end up congregating or bringing together uh, people who share the same label, deficiency, or disorder, or whatever. And um, so uh, all kinds of things end up happening there. In terms of getting to know your neighbors in your neighborhood, uh, people just see the disability or the condition first, and they don't see the individual um, people. And that's a real barrier to kind of getting your, to know your neighbors and finding what good things you have in common <coughs> And what interests you have in common. So grouping people together is, is often what's done. And I have been in Canada, you know, around uh, people who have uh, uh, put together uh, ho group homes, we call them, where four or five or six people might live together. And it's very common that those would be uh, people, uh, all the people there would have autism or all the people would be seen to have uh, severe behavioral disorders of kind, some kind, it's really hard for neighbors in such a neighborhood to see those people one person at a time and as individuals. And then uh, often um, in terms of housing, I'm going to talk to you in a little while about the kind of um, housing that a group of families I've been working with for 19 years in Canada, what they've come about um, building. And uh, people often get so excited about the building that they haven't figured out the real magic to how people are living in their homes. And they've gone off and built a building that they think is somewhat like the one that I'm going to talk about. Um, but what they do is they have maybe 50 apartments in a building, and uh, one third of them might be for people with disabilities, and one third of them might be for seniors who require housing, and the final third might be for homeless people because they really need a home too, right? And people are just grouped together 
in such numbers that again it's really hard for people to look at that group of people and say they're kind of like me um, but so it creates this real us and them mentality so overall uh, there when services design housing for lots of people at a time, um, there's all kinds of issues that come up that uh, don't get really addressed, uh, such as whose home is it? Uh, so I have a, a friend in, uh, in Toronto, a woman that I've known uh, for about 30, 32 years now, a woman with a disability, and she lived for a long, long time in um, an apartment uh, where she had slowly gotten to know her neighbors and new people over time. And at some point in her life, they decided that, uh, you know, she was 55 and almost a senior, which would really, <laughs> and it would be better for her, you know, she was going to be failing soon anyways. And uh, they moved her into a more supported um, uh, housing option, they said, uh, with um, uh, 13 other people with disabilities, right? And so, the home that she thought was her home and she had control and she could be there as long as she was able uh, was actually never um, her home that she had control over. They always had ultimate authority over when they would move her. And in many situations, even in apartments, um, the, na the, the service are the ones who hold the lease and not the individuals themselves. Who makes the decisions in the home are the other uh, things that, that really change. And there's all kinds of answers to this. You know, often uh, um, I'm reminded of a time that I did work in a group living situation and um, I was working with other staff people and we were very excited because we decided everyone was going to get healthy. You know, focus on the we decided, right? So the staff decided everyone was going to get healthy. We took all of that sugary cereal out of the cupboards and stuffed it full of muesli and granola and other good stuff and uh, we really thought things were grand and you know after a while I left that place I came to, back to visit and another group of staff had another idea about um, what kind of breakfast people should eat and there was sugary cereal all over again you know so there, there was supposed to be a home for people uh, but who makes the decisions there you know that's always a key um, key issue I always do things like I listen in on people, uh, even when I knock at people's uh, the door of their home, and I'm listening for uh, the support person to be saying things like, um, "Oh, there's a knock at the door, uh, Brenda. Are you going to get that, or shall I?" And those little little things tell me the difference between whose home is it, who, who's making the d decisions. Other kinds of distortions happen because we're looking at. Um, you know, is it, uh, um, well, the person in the agency is the same kind of thing, but, um, you know, who, who's kind of taking other bigger decisions? And often people are left with decisions like, do you want apple juice or orange juice this morning? Or, you know, um, what are you going to wear today? But bigger decisions uh, such as, you know, when you're upset, who leaves your home? Or um, who are the people you invite into your home? Or should you have some say in the supporters who come into your home? Those are much bigger decisions, much more uh, decisions that impact on, on people's very lives. And those are often made by the agency themselves. Um, another group of uh, factors around uh, control is uh, um, agencies often don't share the same def definition of home. They're often uh, thinking in terms of housing, accommodation. Um, some very clearly think in terms of beds and beds to be filled, which is such a different kind of set of criteria than we're talking about here. And often, uh, you know, they just cannot get around to these kinds of things because these are things that you get to think of one person at a time rather than 40, 50, or whatever the group you're trying to find housing for. So at the very best, those kinds of options can be home-like rather than home themselves. And, but they tend to vary. They're home-like as long as you have staff in place who are focused on that happening, that staff leave, and something else can happen after them. 
And home really is actually more than a place to live. Um, and, but for many people um, where housing is planned for them, uh, that's where they get to be uh, when they're not in their day program or their work program. Um, and, but it, for many of us, a home is in fact the place we start off in the morning and we might come to it various times throughout our day. We might do a part-time job and come back for a bit of a rest or we prefer to eat lunch at home because we like the food that we have there. So for many of us, um, you know, it's much more than just a place to live, but it's a place to thrive, invite other people in and, and really be a fuller place than that. Um, services and people who do kind of thinking of home on a larger scale often don't pay attention to the tension between um, is this a home or is this a place of work? So people who require support in their home for the support workers, that home is actually a place of work. And there's some things that make your place of work a little bit easier. It's easier in your place of work if you've got uh, maybe a telephone with a couple of extensions on it. Uh, if you've got your staff, staff schedule up so you can see quickly who's coming in next. Where you've got the binders and papers and file folders in a filing cabinet and kind of organized. Uh, where if you're working on teaching someone something, maybe you'll put that list up in the bathroom or up in the kitchen where the teaching is going to be happening. Those are all things that help um, someone in a work role um, find their work and do their more work more easily. And they're exactly the opposite to what we think about as home. And if you're not conscious about that difference, you would just allow things to happen. When you're conscious that you want home to be in these ways, you find ways not to have a filing cabinet um, out in the middle of the living room. You find ways to put uh, binders of information in private kinds of places and make sure that home comes through first. Often in uh, um, service settings, uh, rules and regulations um, are the norm um, over uh, kind of hospitality and welcome. So walking into a person's home, there might be uh, 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 things like fire, um, uh, fire exits that are prominently displayed. Um, there might be rules around uh, food. I've been in places where the staff aren't allowed to sit and eat with the people because they haven't contributed to the food budget. Those kinds of odd kinds of rules. And that happens, again, when you're trying to make one set of rules for a whole, whole group of people. Um, <clears throat> and. Uh, in many of these places, um, they, there's often weird things that happen when ordinary things would do uh, just as well. Uh, I know many places where I've walked into a bathroom and seen like a toothbrushing kind of breakdown of how to do this. Um, we've found just over time uh, talking a person through some really good toothbrushing, doing some modeling and whatnot, which is invisible during the rest of the day to everyone, is just as effective as that list, which is typically more helpful for the staff person than it is for the person with a disability. Um, <clears throat> When how, um, home is seen as a program rather than a way to live and a place to be, um, there's all kinds of uh, uh, things that are put in place that feel awkward and, and odd. Rules around kind of making your bed before you come down to breakfast. Uh, my kids would be in big trouble around our house with that rule, right? <laughs> You know, so Michael Kendrick, who most of you know, um, often says, don't do something weird if something ordinary will do. Hence one of my favorite sayings. Um, all right. Speaking of the devil, um, <laughs> uh, Michael, a quote from him is great. Is a real home is not solely one's dwelling place, but rather a key crucible in life that helps sustain and uphold much that is deeply personal, private, and intimate about ourselves and reflects deep, our deep identity values and preferences for a good life. And uh, I think that's a great kind of note to, to end on, to keep us on track, not focused on the distortions which I've just gone through, but making sure we kind of head into the kind of area that we do want to be in.